Laudator Jesus Christus. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined this week again by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the Editor-in-Chief of CFN. Hello, Brian. I'm glad you had safe travels and you're back from, it was Brazil, correct, at a legal conference? Yes, I'm back. I got back yesterday. Uh, I was at the Congreso for the International Union of Catholic Jurists. It's the third time I've been to one of their their conferences, and I had uh, a wonderful trip to Brazil. I met several people who are real regular viewers of our podcast. I have a quick little message for all of our viewers down there. Saúde sois a todos os meus amigos brasileiros. Obrigado pela sua Gentileza e hospitalidade, depois da minha viagem, acredito que o promesso de Nossa Senhora de Fátima de que o dogma de fé estaria sempre em Portugal será cumprida no Brasil. A tradição está em boas mãos. Obrigado por assistir nossa pequeno podcast. So a little uh, hello and and uh, welcome to all those who are watching us down there. I was happy to meet uh, many of you. Wonderful. Well, we got a lot of ground to cover today. <laughs> our uh, our stories this week include, first of all, a new statement from Bishop Athanasius Schneider regarding how to handle, quote, the case of a heretical pope, which he maintains is, quote, humanly uh, irresolvable. That's his position. Secondly, uh, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano's recent statement on the evil of abortion, which he calls an act of worship to Satan. I think that's pretty accurate. And former President Donald Trump's latest comments on the subject of abortion, which sadly um, are very disappointing to say the least. We'll get into the details uh, at, as the show progresses. Uh, next, we're going to look at Pope Francis's speech at a meeting hosted by the notoriously pro-abortion, speaking of abortion, and pro-LGBT Clinton Global Initiative, one of these globalist elitist um, things, kind of like the World Economic Forum, probably. And then finally, we'll end with two stories related to the traditional Latin mass and efforts on the part of bishops to restrict, if not suppress, access to it per traditionis custodis. So those are our stories for this week. But as always, before we get into the news, we will spend a few moments pondering the things that are above, as St. Paul says, uh, take a look at the church's liturgical calendar and try to ground ourselves in the spiritual riches of Holy Mother Church. So we are coming to you live on Thursday, September 21st, the year of our Lord, 2023. And today is the feast of St. Matthew, Apostle and Evangelist. So it's a special feast day for me, of course, my namesake. So yes. happy feast day to all of uh, any viewers out there who might be named Matthew. Uh, happy and holy feast day to you. And it is also Ember Week, those special days where we do fasting and pray for the church and specifically for um, seminarians who are preparing for the for ordinations, whether to the minor orders or major orders. So that's what's going on this week. I wanted to read a brief excerpt from the liturgical year about the Feast of St. Matthew, a little background on this saint. We don't know a whole lot about him, but this is what is in uh, Geranger's mm -hmm. liturgical year. Matthew, also named Levi, was an apostle and evangelist. He was sitting in the custom house at Capernaum when Christ, when called by Christ. So he was, of course, the tax collector, uh, whom he immediately followed and then made a feast for him and his disciples. So he invited our Lord and the other apostles to his home for a, a big feast, a big dinner. Uh, and that's what's recorded in today's gospel for the mass. It says, um, Let's see. And it came to pass, as Jesus was sitting at meat in the house, the house of Matthew, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. And the Pharisees, seeing it, said to his disciples, Why doth your master eat with publicans, that is, tax collectors, and sinners? But Jesus, hearing it, said, They that are in health need not a physician, but they that are ill Go then and learn what this meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the just, but sinners. So that's an important reminder to all of us that uh, while we don't, you know, there's 
there's a correct way to approach that and an incorrect way. The correct way is to meet people where they're at and call them to holiness, call them to turn mm-hmm. on sin and believe in the gospel, be converted. And then there's the James Martin approach that says, you're welcome no ma- regardless of if you change your lifestyle or not. Obviously, that's not what our Lord was uh, was advocating for. Right. So, and say to say, Matthew, yeah, go keep being a corrupt tax collector. <laughs> Right, exactly. So it says in the um, in the liturgical year that he wrote uh, the first gospel, as we all know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He wrote in Hebrew initially, and then it was later translated into Greek. And he preached the gospel in uh, Palestine as well as Ethiopia, and confirmed his teaching by many miracles. One of the greatest of these was his raising to life the local king's daughter, uh, whereby he converted the king and his wife and the whole country. But he eventually ended up being martyred while he was saying mass, actually. Um, It says he was uh, the the new king or the new, you know, the next one in line wanted to marry someone who uh, a woman who had vowed her virginity to God at the apostles uh, suggestion. And he was very upset. So he ordered uh, St. Matthew to be put to death as he was celebrating the holy mysteries at the altar. So great saint for us to remember today and ask for his intercession, uh, apostle and evangelist. And let's see here. I just wanted to mention a couple of unique things about the gospel of St. Matthew. Uh, You know, each gospel, the three synoptic gospels are very similar, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but all of them do have their own individual uh, unique features. So in the gospel of Matthew, we know that uh, it starts out with the genealogy of our Lord, according to the flesh, beginning with Abraham to prove that he is the promised Messiah, the son of David, um, in the Davidic line of kings. Also, the the visit of the Magi in Matthew chapter 2, the Sermon on the Mount. A shorter version does appear in St. Luke's Gospel, but uh, Matthew has the fuller account of that sermon. Very important for us as Catholics, the promise to build the church on St. Peter. This is a passage that all Catholics should have memorized, Matthew 16, verses 13 to 19. And then also the last judgment in Matthew 25, where our Lord talks about after his second coming, he will sit on a throne of great glory and separate the sheep from the goats. And then finally, the Trinitarian formula for baptism, our Lord, uh, the words of our Lord are recorded at the end of St. Matthew's gospel, Matthew 28, verse 19. Mm -hmm. So great feast, a great saint today. Yes, a great, great feast. And again, important on Feast of the Apostles, that preface of the Apostles, really an important prayer for our time. Pray that God will send us good shepherds to guide us in our time. Absolutely. So looking ahead on the traditional Roman calendar, we have some more saints coming up. Tomorrow is St. Thomas of Villanova, who I believe was a bishop and a confessor. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the next day, Saturday the 23rd, St. Linus, one of the early popes. well, he was, uh, was right he after mute? Peter. Yeah, yes, that's what right I was thinking, right Peter. after. And he's the first pope to adopt a particular law requiring the covering of women's head in churches. Yes, so the wearing right. of what we would call the chapel veil, again, take different forms in terms of what it is, but that women should have their head covers goes all the way back to the second pope. Yes. Very ancient custom and law. Yes. The 23rd is also the anniversary of Padre Pio's death. So mm-hmm. another another great uh, man of our times. Uh, the next we have Saints Cyprian and Justina on September 26th. And then next week, Wednesday, the 27th is Saints Cosmos and Damien. Mm-hmm. I think they were brothers, if I remember correctly, and they are mentioned yes. in the canon of the mass. So special saints in that regard. And both doctors, they have a special patronage for for doctors. Yes, that's right. That's right. And before we get into our first story today, I have just a little news brief for you. Yesterday, uh, Bishop Joseph Strickland released a statement regarding the apostolic visitation of his diocese in late June and recent rumors that Pope Francis will ask him to resign. We talked about this in our show last week. Mm Bishop Strickland was appointed in 2012 by Pope Benedict XVI, and he's currently only 64 years old, so well well below the retirement age. Uh, This is what His Excellency said in his statement. I was not given a reason for the visitation, and I have not received any report since. So it's several months later, still nothing. 
And further, he says, quote, I have said publicly that I cannot resign as Bishop of Tyler because that would be me abandoning the flock that I was given charge of by Pope Benedict XVI. I have also said that I will respect the authority of Pope Francis if he removes me from office as Bishop of Tyler. I love Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church, which he established. My only desire is to speak his truth and live God's will to the best of my ability, end quote. So please keep Bishop Strickland in your prayers, and hopefully this you know, supposed request or demand for resignation doesn't end up happening. If it does, we now know that he will resist yes. it, but um, let's hope that Francis doesn't just decide to remove him. And I mean, that would be a terrible situation for Bishop Strickland and for the entire diocese, which, as I understand it, is thriving under his leadership. So it is. And it's really good. He says, because he says, I'm not going to buckle under, you know, I'm not going to do it. And you're going to have to take the really extraordinary step under canon law, which really should be for a, a legitimate reason. Um, the fact that he hasn't heard about the visitation suggests they couldn't dig up anything. They couldn't find it. Right. So uh, keep him in your prayers, definitely. Yes. And on a side note, um, Bishop Strickland has also released another pastoral letter this week, mm -hmm. the fourth in a series of letters in which he addresses certain basic truths of the faith, which he says, quote, will be examined, and my note, likely challenged as part of the Synod on Synodality, some very mm -hmm. important pastoral letters. And the latest one released on Tuesday of this week focuses on the sacraments of matrimony and holy orders. Yes. So I'll try to include a link to that in the description of this video so you can find it and read it in full. We don't have time to cover it in detail today, but it is well worth reading. All right, that brings us to our first story. So last week we discussed Father James Altman's September 6th video message entitled Bergoglio is not the Pope in which Father Altman declares the following, Jorge Bergoglio has in more ways than we can count, but particularly through his sacrilege against the Holy Eucharist, excommunicated himself automatically from the Catholic Church. That is Father Altman's contention. And he bases it on the Council of Trent's decree on the sacrament of the Eucharist, specifically session 13, canon 11, which reads, quote, if anyone says that faith alone is a sufficient preparation for receiving the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist, let him be anathema. And it continues, lest so great a sacrament be received unworthily and hence unto death and condemnation, this holy council determines and decrees that those whose conscience is burdened with mortal sin, no matter how contrite they may think they are, first must necessarily make a sacramental confession if a confessor is available. And the crux of the matter is this line, if anyone presumes to teach or preach or obstinately maintain or defend in public disputation, the opposite of this, which Pope Francis has arguably done, which is the point of bringing up the text on Father Altman's part, he shall by that very fact be excommunicated. Uh, Father Altman also quotes in that video message from St. Robert Bellarmine's De Romano Pontifice on the Roman Pontiff, in which the doctor of the church discusses five opinions on how to deal with a heretical pope, which is found in Book 2, Chapter 30 of that work. So seemingly, we don't know for sure, but seemingly in response to Father Altman's video, Bishop Athanasius Schneider has released a statement on the validity of Pope Francis in which he argues, as he's done in the past, quote, there is no authority to declare or consider an elected and generally accepted pope as an invalid pope. And he goes on, quote, even in the case of a heretical pope, he will not lose his office automatically, and there is no body within the church to declare him deposed because of heresy. Such actions would come close to a kind of heresy of conciliarism or episcopalism. The heresy of conciliarism or episcopalism says basically that there is a body within the church, for example, an ecumenical council, a synod, the College of Cardinals, College of Bishops, which can issue a legally binding judgment over the Pope. And that is heretical. Yeah. Um, so that what he's articulating is essentially the third opinion discussed by St. Robert Bellarmine, namely that, quote, 
the Pope is, is not and cannot be deposed either by secret or manifest heresy. Mm -hmm. And regarding this opinion, Bellarmine observes that, quote, it would be the most miserable condition of the church if she were to be compelled to recognize a wolf manifestly prowling for a shepherd. So I think if St. Robert Bellarmine were around and could uh, answer Bishop Schneider, he might object to Bishop Schneider's reasoning. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, I, again, I think the problem with the arguments that are presented sort of by, by Father Altman is, and, and others, and again, it's interesting, Father Altman doesn't say he's a, quote, saint of a contest, so I found that very interesting that he never claims that. But right. a lot of what his arguments they'd agree with are, are kind of these clipped quotes um, from Bellarmine, from Council of Trent, that really do need to be seen in their broader juridical context. And I think... I think Rafael Bellarmine as a jurist would agree with Bishop Snyder that although as, a, as an exercise, we can say there are these various opinions, this would be really a, a horrible thing if you, we had to do this. But again, I think it, Bellarmine is often misrepresented by those who want to justify state of Acantism as, as mm. holding this. And I think Schneider is right that this is these various opinions are mere opinions. And in 2000 years, we've never had any historical evidence for this ability. And the change in canon law made it even clearer, you know, that there, there is no way of, of dealing with this. And ultimately, um, again, I think those who, this is the, their ease, Chris Farr says this a lot, this is an easy solution to a hard problem. Right. If, if you don't have the proper understanding of obedience, and I think Bishop Snyder does, then you have to embrace this position because you have no way to deal with a wolf in sheep's closing that you have to acknowledge as occupying the office because mm -hmm. you just say I have to believe everything they say. So I, I actually think if you don't just quote clip from Bellarmine, I think Bellarmine would appreciate what, what Schneider is saying faced with this real reality of Pope Francis. Because again, Bellarmine right. writes hypothetically. And I don't think right. you could ever imagine the position that we're in today. Right. Bishop Schneider does say in this new statement, quote, the theory of the automatic loss of the papacy due to heresy remains only an opinion. Mm -hmm. And even St. Robert Bellarmine noticed this and did not present it as a teaching of yes. the magisterium itself. The perennial papal magisterium never taught such an opinion. He also says as you were talking about the, the issue of canon law, in 1917, Bishop Schneider explains, when the code of canon law came into force, uh, the magisterium of the church eliminated from the new legislation the remark of the decretum graziani in the old corpus juris canonici, which stated that a pope who deviates from right doctrine can be deposed. So that was eliminated in 1917. Never in history did the magisterium of the church admit any canonical procedures of deposition of a heretical pope. I mean, there have been other medieval and and um, like counter-reformation era theologians who, again, have speculated what you would do in that circumstance, right. like Cajetan, John of St. Thomas, for example. Yes. Um, but ultimately, as, as, um, as Bishop Snyder says, the church has no power uh, over the Pope formally or juridically. And, sure, and again, go ahead. The closest the church has come is a future Pope going back and condemning a prior Pope, which is very different from um, right. someone at the time of the Pope. Right. So he says the sure Catholic tradition says that in the case of a heretical Pope, the members of the church can avoid him, resist him, refuse to obey him, obviously, if his yes. commands are illegitimate or something. Yes all of which can be done without requiring a theory or opinion that says that a heretical pope automatically loses his office or can be deposed consequently. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, he says, uh, since the case of a heretical pope is humanly irresolvable, we must implore with supernatural faith a divine intervention because that singular erring pope is not eternal but temporal. And the church is not in our hands, but in the the almighty hands of God. So yes. that is Bishop Schneider on the the question of a heretical pope. Yes. 
Well, and again, it's to live, uh, what's the Chinese proverb, to live in interesting times. And sort of the, the yes. grace God's given us is to live in times like this, where I think we've seen things that Bellarmine and Suarez, you know, could not could not even imagine. Again, my take on this, I've talked about it before. I think it's above all our pay grades, right? I think it's not up to us to determine this. And as long as we identify heresy as heresy and say, I won't believe that, um, then we don't have to fear. We don't have to worry about this. And if someday the church in the future were to declare any pope illegitimate or condemned, then then we would accept that. But we don't have to answer this question for ourselves, you know, right now. As long as we know the Catholic faith, we're receiving the sacraments. Um, it really is, you know, not not essential for us. Um, I think I was just going to say to, before we go on to our next story, I think one thing that all of us would agree on, including Bishop Schneider would be that um, even if a heretical Pope cannot be deposed, the college of bishops and specifically the college of Cardinals still have a duty to publicly admonish him. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And to warn as Bishop Strickland is doing to warn the flock against it. Yes. They certainly have that, that duty. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, that's very, but that's what Bishop Snyder himself has done through his writings and his speeches. So, um, again, it's, it's a sad situation. Uh, I, I would pray for Father Altman. Again, sometimes his, his zeal is excellent, but sometimes people like that, when they sort of get, get, they, they, they get led down a path that is a little, little dangerous. Again, I think he can come back from this. I think it's significant that he was just sort of you know, saying this, but he, he, I think there's a chance he could clarify his position a little bit. So we'll see. Yes. Speaking of needing to clarify. Uh, clarify yes. Right? <laughs> yes. So we have two uh, incidents occurred this week on the topic of uh, abortion. Uh, the first is really one of the most strongly worded statements uh, of Archbishop Vigano uh, on uh, the topic of abortion. And uh, you can Go to our website on September 15th. We posted both a video and written text uh, of Archbishop uh, Vigano on this uh, topic. So basically, he, he uses, as I said, very, uh, very strong language and some really interesting uh, comparisons. Like he starts off by pointing out the crazy situation we live in when you can go to a prison for praying outside of an abortion clinic, but not for killing the children inside, right? That, that, right. That irony, uh, he really uh, brings out clearly. And you can be discriminated against um, for opposing abortion, but not for being a murderer. And he's sort of saying this is the upside down world um, we are in. Um, and, and the horrors of abortion right, are not just the natural level that a child can, which is horrible in and of itself, that they have mm -hmm. no chance to live a natural life but that it ends the possibility of the, the introduction of sanctifying grace and the growth of that grace within the soul of the child. And the supernatural death of abortion uh, is even you know, a greater, makes it even a greater crime than euthanasia, which obviously ends early the natural life of a person, but at least a person who's maybe 80 years old with euthanasia, I'm not just for euthanasia in any way, it's still a horrible sin, but at least they have had the opportunity to receive the sacraments, be baptized, whereas a child uh, a few weeks in the womb uh, does not have that. And that's why he points out, which is always really interesting, that the um, adepts of the Church of Satan consider abortion, and they've argued it, a religious ritual uh, mm -hmm. of, them, of them. That in the movie we've spoken about before of Nefarious comes out very clearly when the devil that possesses the man in the movie basically you know, makes clear that it is, this is action of hell and that hell receives uh, honor or receives worship uh, when uh, this occurs, comparing it to the uh, slaughter of the innocents in the uh, great cauldrons of the God of Moloch uh, in, mm. in the past. Uh, there's a great line where he says, today's priests wear uh, uh, masks and surgical sc scrubs or something to that, that effect. Hmm. Um, Really strong with the world is dripping with innocent blood that has been shed by an elite of subversives devoted to Satan and declared enemies of Christ. So again, abortion, as he makes clear, is not just a natural, again, it is not just a natural evil, 
uh, mm-hmm. it is rises really to this this greater uh, level uh, of a, There's a spiritual dimension to it. Yes, and he really ends it, uh, which is really the most significant point here um, uh, about um, uh, those who are, are sort of inferred with this. Um, then they must reject uh, abortion politicians. He says, um, no nation can hope for prosperity and harmony as long as it allows this daily massacre accompanied by the complicit silence of politicians who call themselves Catholic, but who contradict the gospel by approving iniquitous laws. Banning abortion must be the first initiative of any ruler who wants to oppose the new world order subservient to Satan. Fighting for this must be an imperative commitment of every Catholic worthy of baptism. So in other words, you can't just say, oh, let's just get on to the economy, right? And and again, as important as the economy is, it affects people's lives. Uh, This is the most important uh, issue. So interestingly, this comes out uh, right at the same time that Donald Trump uh, has grants an interview uh, in which he talks about abortion. So he's on uh, Meet the Press, uh, and um, he, you know, at first patted himself on the on the uh, back, you know, for appointing the justice of the Supreme Court. Here's where I agree with Governor DeSantis, who said, "Look, give him credit for that. That's true." But then he basically touts his plan for a compromise to put the issue behind us. Hmm. Like, let's just get rid of this. But he doesn't mean that in the way of let's just get it outlawed and put it behind us. He essentially, we'll get into the details, outlines a plan where we don't restrict very many abortions. Um, It is really, really sad. So let's take a look at the first clip uh, of what Trump says in this Meet the Press interview. What you want. I want to know what you're going to do if you're really- We are going to come together. Would you sign federal legislation that would ban abortion at 15 weeks? No, no, let me just tell you what I do. I'm going to come together with all groups and we're going to have something that's acceptable. Right now, to my way of thinking, the Democrats are the radicals because after four and five and six months, but, but you have to say this, after birth. You have New York State and other places that pass legislation where you're allowed to kill the baby after birth. Mr. President, I want to give voters who are going to be weighing in on this election yeah. a very clear sense of where I think you stand I on I think this. they're all going to like me. I think both sides are going to like me. Let, let me what, but what's let Mr. going President, to have to Mr. happen President, is you're going to have to... This question, listen, please. you're asking me a question. What's going to happen is you're going to come up with a number of weeks or months. You're going to come up with a number that's going to make people happy. Because 92% of the Democrats don't want to see abortion after a certain period of time. If a federal ban landed on your desk, if you were reelected, would you sign it at 15 weeks? Are you weeks? talking about a complete ban? A ban at 15 weeks. Well, people, people are starting to think of 15 weeks. That seems to be a number that people are talking about right now. Would you sign that? I, uh, I would, that's I would almost four months along, has to be clear. That's, that's very late. And we'll end up with peace on that issue for the first time in 52 years. Uh, I'm not going to say I would or I wouldn't. I mean, DeSantis w- is willing to sign a five-week and six-week ban. Would you support that? You think I, that I goes think what he far? did is a terrible thing and a terrible mistake. So again, a couple really critical points of that. Notice he won't commit one of the, one way or the other, even on a fifteen week ban. Right. He sort of implies, but he won't commit to it. And you know, depending which studies you look at, a fifteen week ban would only prevent ten to fifteen, maybe at most twenty percent, but that's really on the high end of abortions right. that occur in this country. Um, so. Uh, you know, his whole thing seemed to be, can't we all just get along? Can't we just, you know, come up with some compromise? Well, this isn't about like the rate of taxes or the right. amount of government debt. This is about lives. And he's basically saying, let's just compromise some lives. We'll let these people die, you know, and a few other people live. It's uh, trying to regulate really, murder, basically. Uh, basically. Now, again, there are certain points where it's it, it's so difficult to prove an abortion occurred very early on, perhaps, that you might say, which is really hard to prove. So we can't prosecute it this early at two, three weeks. And that's a prosecutorial decision, right? We can't punish people for that. 
But that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is let's just, you know, compromise and come up with a number which will make both people happy. This is something you cannot make both people happy on. That would be like saying back in the Civil War, let's make the slave owners and the people that think slavery is horrible both happy. I mean, it's they're irreconcilable positions. Uh, and it's just not not possible. So that really, really disappointing. Um, let's go on another clip a little further in the interview. Some anti-abortion groups are really looking for some clarity from you. So let me just ask you to put a fine point on this. Should the federal government impose any abortion restrictions or should it be completely left up to the states? No, I don't think you should have. I don't think you should be allowed to have abor abortions well into a pregnancy. But what about the question we're I going just to asked agree, you? No, we're going to agree to a number of weeks or months or however you want to define it. And both sides are going to come together. And both sides, both sides, and this is a big statement, both sides will come together. And for the first time in 52 years, you'll have an issue that we can put behind us. At the federal level? Uh, it could be state or it could be federal. I don't frankly care. So you're not committed to a ban at the I federal I will say level. this, everybody, uh, including the great legal scholars, love the idea of Roe v. Wade terminated so it be brought back to the states. It okay. sounds like that's what you think, too, that well, it should I, remain I would, a state I issue. I would say this. From a pure standpoint, from a legal standpoint, I think it's probably better. But I can live with it either way. It's much more important. The number of weeks is much more important. No answer. He won't answer the question. Um, now, again, at least Ron DeSantis has been clear. He thinks the proper place to deal with it is the states. Um, so at least he gave an answer. Now, you may disagree with that. Tried that before the Civil War on slavery. Didn't work out too well. Um, but, you know, at least he gave an answer. That was a really disappointing answer. It seems like he just wants to, you know, as I said, not really focus on this issue. Um, last clip. Let's take a look at this one. Former Vice President Mike Pence believes that a fetus should have constitutional rights. Do you believe that, Mr. Well, President? Well, Mike Pence said something about 15 weeks, too, which was a big change for Mike Pence because Mike Pence had no exceptions. I have exceptions, by the way. I think people should have exceptions. I think if it's rape or incest or the life of the mother, I think you Which have is to exactly have how we got Roe v. Wade in the first place. Uh, exactly. And that's <laughs> that's like saying... You're not allowed to be a vigilante. You can't go out just punishing people as a private citizen. Well, unless the crime they committed was rape or incest. I mean, this is worse because you're not going after the, the perpetrator. You're right. going after the vic you know, a victim of the crime. Uh, but it's just that those exceptions make absolutely no sense. Oh, it's murder. Unless somebody else committed a crime before you, then it's okay. Right. Um, problem. Constitutional rights. And, and a lot of people, when they don't have exceptions. Now, I will tell you that I think most people, most Republicans are willing. Uh, you go life of the mother, mm -hmm. rape, incest. I think most of them are, are there. But should a fetus a have statement. constitutional rights, Mr. President? Well, Just I don't know. I don't know what he's saying, because before he wanted, you know, you couldn't have a book. What are you saying? Now, all of what a do sudden, you excuse think? me. Now, all of a sudden, he's saying 15 weeks. I said, wow, where did that come from? That's a radical change. Look, something is going to happen that's going to be good for everybody. And that's what I'm, I'm almost like a Not mediator for the in this case. Covered. They wanted Roe v. Wade <laughs> terminated because it was inappropriate. We got it done. Something is going to happen. It's going to be a number of weeks. Something's... Again, he just keeps repeating himself. He never answers yeah. the question, uh, do, do children have constitutional rights before they're born, including the right to life? Doesn't answer it, which basically the answer is no. If he won't answer, do they do? He's really saying they don't. And he just keeps coming back to essentially where he says somewhere else, can't we just put this behind us and get on to the economy? Um, again, as Archbishop Vigano said, this is the most important issue of our time, because how can any society exist when the murder of the most vulnerable Right. Uh, is, Maybe we can reread okay. what he said. He said, no nation can hope for prosperity and harmony yes. as long as it allows this daily massacre accompanied by the complicit silence of politicians. Yeah. He says who call themselves Catholics, but really this is not a Catholic issue. This is a matter of the natural law. You don't have to be a Catholic to yes. understand that abortion is intrinsically evil and mm -hmm. cannot be allowed under any circumstance. So again, because it's it's interesting coming from Archbishop Vigano, because he you know was very supportive of Donald Trump in 2020. It, it still has clarified an interview with us. He's doing some good to stop some of the globalists, but here he's really warning Catholics. He's he's not on the right page uh, now on this issue.
Right. Uh, so speaking of being to... on the wrong page, uh, yeah. Pope Francis uh, had an interesting meeting with uh, a group of shady characters. <laughs> yes, he did. So uh, this is from the Life Sites report on this. It basically, Pope Francis spoke at this globalist pro-abortion conference hosted by the Clintons. Uh, in a video link speech given to Bill Clinton at the pro-abortion and pro-LGBT Clinton Global Initiative Conference, Pope Francis highlighted a culture of dialogue and, quote, listening, but refrained from mentioning the sanctity of life of the unborn. So uh, we're going to play a clip in just a moment, but this is what, so Pope Francis joined the meeting remotely via video link and President, former President Bill Clinton greeted him saying, uh, Holy Father, we are so honored to have you join us uh, at CGI this year. You're speaking to a room full of people from all over the world, from all walks of life, who each in their own way are trying to follow the admonition of Isaiah, the biblical prophet, who told us uh, we had to be repairers of the breach. I don't think Clinton is in any place to be even alluding to scripture, let alone quoting it and touting it. Um, he goes on to say, they know our world is broken in many ways. Uh, yes, because of sin, Mr. President, but also full of many possibilities. And they're trying to make the most of their ability to make a difference. I thought it would be interesting, given our wonderful meeting a few weeks ago at the Vatican, if you could say what you believe about the obligations of ordinary people to make a difference, to deal with these big challenges that are so big that no person, no matter how wealthy or powerful, no person can believe that he or she could do them alone. And here's where he asks the question of the Pope. What are ordinary people supposed to do with their days that will make our societies better or our problems less severe. So before I play the Pope's, the beginning of the Pope's answer, just think about that question for a moment. Let me read it again for you. What are ordinary people supposed to do with their days that will make our societies better or our problems less severe? And ask yourself, what is the Catholic answer to that question? Yeah. How would St. Peter, for example, answer that question? How would St. Matthew answer that question? How would any of the saints and martyrs throughout history answer that question? I think first and foremost, they would repeat the words of our Lord, repent and believe the gospel and live it. Mm. That's step number one. This is how Pope Francis chose to answer the question. It is important to spread a culture of encounter, a culture of dialogue, recall that in the Gospels. a culture of listening and of understanding. It is necessary to share thoughts on how to contribute to the common good and how not to leave behind the most vulnerable, vulnerable people, such as children, who through the foundation, the patrons of Bambino Gesù, are at the root of this meeting. We all know it. We are living through a changing epic. Only together can we emerge from it better. Together. Only together can we heal the world. Only together can we heal the world. Not Christ the King. <laughs> right. Not God. Not right. Christ. That's it's just unbelievable that he would say that. And again, he's all into listening. Well, why didn't he have the Clintons listen to him about what's wrong with their stances on abortion? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And he goes on to say in his his speech, no challenge can be overcome alone, not alone, uh, but moving together, sisters and brothers, children of God. That's his single mention of God. And it's misplaced because not all people on this planet Earth are children of God. Uh, we're all creatures of God on a natural level. Only those who, through faith and baptism, have received sanctifying grace are children of God. As we read every Sunday, uh, the priest reads every Sunday after low mass uh, from the first chapter of St. John's Gospel. I forget the exact, here, let me uh, pull it up here in my missal. I want to get the exact wording for you. Here we go. So 
He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, he gave them power to be made the sons of God. They wouldn't have needed power to be made sons of God if they already were, obviously. To them that believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, born of water and the Holy Ghost, as our Lord says in John chapter 3. So that's the single mention of God, children of God, and it's completely off off base. Hmm. Um, he, He goes on to say, um, what is it? It's time to work together to stop the ecological catastrophe before it's too late. That was his main focus. That's why I've chosen to write a new document 10 years after the publication of the encyclical Laudato Si. Let us stop while there is still time. Please, please let us stop while there is still time. It's time to face migration emergencies. Remember that we are not talking about numbers, but about people, men, women, and children. When we talk about migration, let's think about the eyes of the children we've seen in refugee camps. Mm -hmm. It's time to think about the youngest, the children, and their education and to their care. Well, what about the children in the womb, Holy Father, Mm -hmm. that this organization completely disregards and spits upon and literally celebrates their murder? Not only the organization, Bill, Hillary Clinton, the other people, as you saw in that picture earlier, the governor of Illinois, Pritzker, who next to New York signed one of the most extensive, quote, protections for abortion, uh, is promoting it, is encouraging people to come from other states to have abortions there. And uh, Gretchen, witch lady, Witchmer, uh, <laughs> doing the same thing in her state. I mean, what are you doing? By, by, you know, being around these people and not coming to them and calling them to conversion. Right. It's like if our Lord, just as we talked about in the beginning, yeah. he went to have dinner at the, the home of St. Matthew when he was still a publican. Uh, but he didn't say, hey, you're doing a great job with that tax collecting, pal. Just keep up the good work. <laughs> um, go encounter. No. Go and go listen and encounter while you're being a crooked tax collector. Right. Yes. So it's just terrible. Yeah. And so. Um, as as the picture that Brian showed earlier, and I was going to mention briefly, so the Pope spoke on September 18th, what was that, Monday of this week, yeah. the next day of this conference, there was a panel discussion, two panel discussions actually, called Women's Rights Are Human Rights, How to Provide Abortion Care in a Post-Dobbs World. And let's let's be clear, there's no way that Pope Francis could not know that Bill and Hillary Clinton are pro-abortion. That it's a notorious fact. There's no way that he could be ignorant of that. Just like there's no way he could be ignorant of Joe Biden's position. It's simply impossible. So here's the um, the description for this panel discussion that they had. There is significant disparity in access to reproductive rights globally, with some countries expanding access while others are rolling back decades long protections. As global supply chains reckon with ways to continually evolve best practices to meet patients' needs and serve vulnerable communities, the United States once presented a model for access to safe, legal abortion. Oh, what about that rare clause, Bill? Yeah. Wasn't that his phrase, safe, legal, and rare? rare. Apparently Apparently, they don't care about the rare part. But in recent years, the description says... There has been a sharp decline in access to care, culminating in the Supreme Court's 2022 Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade. In comparison, reproductive rights have been expanding in other countries like Thailand and Spain. The global supply chain for abortion services. What does that even mean, global (laughs) supply chain? It's not like a physical product they're producing. It's... (laughs) Uh, it says it can and must continue to evolve to meet to best meet all patient needs, especially for the most at risk and in need communities and populations. And again, this uh, this is not patient needs. Pregnancy is not a disease that right. needs to be treated. <laughs> that's right. that's unbelievable. And I listened to some of the panel discussions, and these people are just. It's sickening to li- listen to them talk. One of the ladies on one of the panels 
was wearing earrings that literally had abortion pills like put into them a fat making a fashion statement with those and joking about how oh we could sell these who who wants a pair of these earrings she's saying that they should uh, the abortifacient drugs should be just as available they should be over the counter no different than tylenol or aspirin so that women and teenage girls can use them as often as necessary just mm-hmm. sick sick so uh, they you know we can only scratch our heads and wonder why would the vicar of christ the roman pontiff participate in anything with these ghoulish people it's unbelievable to see Hmm. it is it is uh really a a scandal to the church that francis was even in the company of these people when not calling to to correct them well speaking of scandals our final story is liturgical and the uh, what Francis seems to be his his final push to uh, eradicate the traditional, which I'll never do, but traditional sacraments and mass uh, of the church. And we really have kind of two two stories uh, that I think show what's what's going on. One we saw on Verate Celi, which quotes from Crisis Magazine uh, reports. I just want to read their their quote. Um, now, we, we've been speculating for two years that this is what's been going on. Traditions came out. Bishop, A lot of bishops ignored it, didn't do anything about it, business as usual. And Francis and Roche were furious. Roche comes out with his dubia to try to push it further. Then other bishops are being pressured and threatened. Uh, we know some letters. We've had some bishops talk about letters they've gotten from the Vatican. When this latest development, we learned about the role of Christophe Pierre, uh, the apostolic nuncio, the soon to be made a cardinal, soon to be made a cardinal, the successor of Archbishop Vigano in that position. Uh, so here's what Crisis reported: the latest development in the ongoing saga over Tertius Custodis is the result of the Archbishop of Los Angeles, Jose Gomez, and the Bishop of Orange, Kevin Van, being taken in for questioning at the Politburo, you know, at the the KGB office, by the (laughs) Apostolic Nuncio to the United States, Christophe Pierre, as to their alleged non-compliance with Traditionis Custodis. The result of that particular trip to to, uh, Gestapo headquarters was that in Orange County, the uh, traditional Latin Mass at St. Mary's by the Sea, you know, that's been around for ages. I know lots of people that have gone there, mm-hmm. uh, which basically saved that church. It was about to close down because nobody was going to mm-hmm. it uh, decades ago, was suppressed. And in Los Angeles, uh, the traditional Latin mass that had been well integrated into parish life was sent to the gym. <laughs> so you can't be in a church. You can be in a gym. Now, again, what's uh, incredible about this for alleged noncompliance with Church Jonas Custodis but Trishkinos Custodes, remember the whole cover story? Oh, the bishop's power has been taken away. We need to give it back to the bishop. Quote, it belongs to the diocesan bishop as moderator and promoter and guardian of the whole liturgical life of the particular church entrusted to him to regulate the liturgical celebrations of his diocese. This was liberation for the bishops to do what they want to do that big bad Pope Benedict stopped letting them have the freedom to do. And as we said at the time, this was all a lie. It was a cover mm-hmm. story. It was the freedom of the bishops to do what Roach and Francis wanted them to do, not the freedom to regulate as they saw fit. So again, these are not very conservative bishops, Gomez and Van, uh, but they did what church has always done and respected the liturgical practices of their diocese. They supported it. And now mm-hmm. they are brought in for questioning. I don't know what they said to them in that questioning, but they clearly got the message because they went home and changed it. So really what's new about this story is showing the role of the apostolic nuncio to exert pressure right. uh, to get things done. So there's a And group- he's probably not alone. There are, the nuncios around yeah. the world are probably doing the same thing uh, with absolutely. wayward bishops. So there's a group in D.C., uh, for who prays each week the rosary for the restoration of the Latin Mass right outside the papal nunciature in Washington, D.C. Uh, so great on them for organizing this. Get in his face, right? Pray outside there uh, every week. That's wonderful, uh, reminding him uh, of what he's doing as, as wrong. Well, our parallel story um, to this one uh, comes out of 
uh, Panama. And we've reported a little bit for, before about the hostility of the Panamanian bishops to the traditional Latin mass. They've been uh, pretty hostile in the past. But this week, they came out, uh, the Bishops' Conference of Panama published a communique um, basically warning everybody away from the SSPX. Because again, a lot of people have said this is going to be a two pincer strategy, right? Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, first shut down all the traditional Latin masses, the, the quote approved ones, and then either get everybody to go to the society and excommunicate them or then cut off this, the, you know, try to scare people from the society. So clearly that's where the, the, the Panamanian bishops are. So here's what they say. Uh, uh, that, you know, the, um, and this was September 14th by, by the way, um, that they basically said, we notify the people of God, Vatican II term, that the priestly fraternity of St. Pius X, founded by Archbishop Lefebvre, is not in full communion with the Catholic Church. So the Catholic faithful must refrain from attending its services. Well, its services. <laughs> okay. So you can't even pray the rosary there. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> As for the sacraments administered at their services, the faithful are reminded that to administer sacraments, the approval of the bishop or the ecclesiastical authority is required. And by not having it, these are illicit. Well, a little lesson for you bishops of Panama in simple ecclesiastical law, Pope Francis has authorized the administration of penance directly. He has given them right. faculties to administer it. So you say you can't go there because the bishop or other ecclesiastical authority, that's the pope, uh, has authorized it. So who is the person that doesn't respect the authority of the pope now? They're basically saying, blowing that off, saying can't go anyway, even if the pope says so. And the pope has also said a little more complicated way about marriage uh, as well, that the bishop right. should grant authority uh, uh, for receiving vows. Um, so it is that is just a false statement to say right. sacraments are uh, illicit. It's even false in its broadness. The administration of the sacraments, uh, it, it differs sacrament to sacrament. Confession and um, marriage, so the most juridical requirement, but you don't have to get the bishop's authorization to baptize. That, that that's absolutely incorrect mm -hmm. so they just really show themselves to not know what they're talking about but clearly it's sad because it seems what they want to do is cut off every avenue to the traditional catholic faith uh mm -hmm. do as they've done in panama get rid of all the quote indult masses and then uh basically write off everybody at the society of saint pius x is ill quote ill licit um very very unjustified uh statement uh, by these Panamanian bishops who don't even really seem to know canon law or the first thing uh, about the things they're pontificating about. And speaking of canon law, I just want to read what the current code of canon law says about communion. It, it, first of all, I don't even know where this term full communion came from because uh, I can't seem to find it in canon law itself. It, it is. Talk, it just it's talks about term. communion. Yes. So, so this is what canon law says. Those baptized are fully in the communion of the Catholic Church. So I guess fully instead of full communion. Right. On this earth, who are joined with Christ in its visible structure by the bonds of, of the profession of faith, the sacraments, and ecclesiastical governance. Well, the members of the SSPX clearly profess the same faith and share in the same sacraments as the Catholic Church. And as Brian said, they also have habitual faculties to absolve sins from the current Roman pontiff, who likewise authorizes local ordinaries the possibility to grant faculties for the celebration of marriages of faithful who follow the pastoral activity of the society, to quote from the 2017 yes. uh, Pontifical Ecclesia Day letter. So how does the uh, SSPX not meet the canonical criteria for full communion? That's my question. Well, and again, it's a made-up Vatican II term. It doesn't exist. You're either Catholic or you're not. You can't be half Catholic. You either are or you aren't. You can't be half married, right? You can't be, I'm not in full marriage with this woman. I mean, you're either married or you're not. And, and frankly, the Pope has no power to grant faculties to administer sacraments to non-Catholics. So by saying that the priests of the society have the faculty to administer sacrament of, of uh, penance, he is saying they are Catholic priests because you can't yeah. authorize Lutheran 
lay people to administer sacraments that are reserved to the ordained priesthood. So again, it is just that that whole term was created for a purpose. It means nothing. It is so ambiguous. It's so you can denounce. It was done for really the reason so you can act as if people who are not Catholic are Catholic. So, oh, they're, those Lutherans, they're just not in full communion. Well, they're not in any right. type of communion with the Catholic Church, but it's also used to sort of push out people that are in communion, but you want to pretend are not. So it's really a term that doesn't describe anyone. Yes, sadly. So, very sad. Well, that brings us to the end of our reporting for this week. We thank everyone who has watched live. And thank you for everybody who's been commenting in the live chats. We appreciate your participation in the show. And to everyone who will watch the recording later, thank you so much for joining us. If you've enjoyed the show today, please do give us a like on YouTube and Rumble where the both of our channels are located and make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you're notified when we go live. We typically uh, live stream a weekly news roundup each week as the title, the show title implies on Thursdays typically. Uh, so we hope you're able to join us again next week. Uh, if you enjoy this content we make available for free online, please do consider supporting our apostolate through a subscription to our monthly publication. Visit catholicfamilynews.com and click on the new subscription tab. Um, for anybody who might be going to the Catholic Identity Conference, I will be there uh, in Pittsburgh, so I might, hopefully I'll get to meet you in person. Um, so uh, that might affect our programming for next week. We might have to do our show on uh, Wednesday, because I'll be traveling on Thursday, but uh, stay tuned for that. And we will close, as always, by uh, entrusting all of our needs and intentions to Our Lady. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the instruments of his holy passion, that thou may put division in the camp of thy enemies, for as thy beloved Son has said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for us. Uh, Saint Matthew. Pray for us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, it was great to be back with all of you again, and uh, good to see you again, Matt, and we look forward to sharing about an hour with you next time. God bless you. Take care.